keep in mind that you know when we discuss things we sometimes go on tangents and that's great that being said I still want to make sure that we cover the stuff that we need to for your assignments and for the main points of the labs that we've gone over because typically each lab or each exam we go over has a reason has a purpose for for it and the last one was about two things about the table layout and listeners now a word about layouts layouts um, are going to be the root tag of your XML file in other words when we look at your layout XML file is typically something like main.xml or something like that after the declarations up here the first tag is going to be something layout and the last tag is going to be end layout Those layouts relate to the way that different views are positioned on your screen. And so far we've seen at least three, and you can correct me if I'm missing one, all right? But we've seen a linear layout, we've seen a relative layout, and we've now seen a table layout, okay? A linear layout is just as the name implies one thing after another and we can orient it vertically or we can orient it horizontally. A relative layout we define one thing in relation to something else. So we saw that I think in the first example where we define that the image is below the text. The text is to the right of some other image or something like that. We start with our first thing and then every subsequent thing is in relation to the other things that are in the layout. I don't like that one. All right. So I probably will never do an example of that one. But if you want to do that, you know, if you have the need for that, then, then that's something you can use. Last, a table, alum, uh, a table layout where the table layout is consistent of a series of rows and inside each of those rows we have views. Now the one thing that we did not talk about is I think we talked about it but we haven't seen an example of at least not of yet is that you can actually have layouts embedded within layouts so I can say my main layout is a vertically oriented linear layout so I have my first block of things or I have my first thing second thing third thing fourth thing I can net out so that the first thing itself could be a table layout or it could be another linear layout that would be oriented horizontally all right or anything like that so I could for example nest and have a linear layout which is oriented horizontally or vertically rather one of the attributes and I can't spell today but I could have nested within that another linear layout that may be horizontally so what that would mean is the blocks would be stacked vertically on the screen but if this was a horizontal linear layout, then within that, I could block things horizontally. All right, so you can nest these things. Pardon me? Well, anything that you would want to have, like the general flow be vertical of the stuff on the screen, but for one specific spot of the screen, you want multiple elements that are oriented horizontally. The alternative, of course, for this would be to make a table layout if I wanted to do that. All right, so do keep in mind that, that there's a lot of ways you can accomplish the same thing. A lot would have to do with, when I think table, I think of something that is very regular. In other words, it's typically going to have four columns in each, in each. So, so it's got four views in each uh, row. Whereas if I had one horizontal thing that had 15 elements and another horizontal thing that had one element, I probably wouldn't use a table. I'd probably do a nested 
horizontal within a vertical. Now, the other thing that we did is we talked about listeners. All right, let me back up for one second. The new layout that we had last time was a table layout, which again, we talked about tables consist of rows, uh, table rows, and then we have our views inside there. Now, we can put spans in there so that it goes across multiple columns. Uh, in case uh, we don't have the, the uniform number of columns in each row. All right. The other thing we talked about is listeners. All right. Listeners are code that, that deal with, that wait for, that listen for, the user interacting with the device in some way. So what have we seen so far? We've seen the click listener whereas the user interacts with the clicking of the button. All right. We've seen a text change listener where the user interacts with the text box and types something in and we want some code to run based on that. And we've seen code where the user slides a slider controller. So that's the three interactions that we've seen so far. In a nutshell, when you want code to run when the user interacts with the screen in a certain way, you're going to have a listener. All right? And again, depending on the specific kind of control and the specific action that you're talking about, you're going to have a different kind of listener. Now, so far we've seen two ways to declare a listener. All right? One way is to simply have our activity implement the appropriate listener. All right? I could go back and if you want to, you're welcome to go back and change the tip calculator, Deedle's tip calculator, so the activity itself is the text change listener and progress change listener on the slider. You could do that, no problem. All right? And if you want to experiment with that, that would be a great little exercise to do. So that's one way you can have a listener. Typically, that's done only in very simple apps where you have very limited interactions um, because that would make your activity have a lot of stuff in it if you did that. The second thing that we did is we created an anonymous inner class. And it was called an anonymous class because the class doesn't have a name. All right? And it's called an inner class because the class is defined inside another class's definition. All right? Um, in that case, we simply create a new instance of whatever kind of listener we want. And again, in all cases, if something is going to serve the role of a listener, it has to have implemented the events or the methods that that listener has. Because the listeners typically are interfaces. And interfaces, when you create a, an instance of an interface, you are promising to implement these certain number of methods. So in the case, case of a button, it's on click. On the case of text change, I think it was, there was text change, text starting changing, st text finishing changing, or something like that. There were three methods. And if you remember, we only had code in one of those three methods, right? But you still have to declare those other methods just to let the compiler know, I got this handled. This is a valid listener. It can handle the three events even if I don't want to do anything in the case of two of the events. Um, there was a similar thing with the slider. Any questions over any of those con, uh, uh, concepts or any of the stuff that we went over in last class? Yes? No, that's, that, that's, to, to, uh, that, that's right from the Deedle uh, example. Actually, I think I actually did upload the tip calculator. Uh, a few times ago, a few classes ago. Remember, because the tip calculator was part of your first lab. So that was probably updated, uploaded in the week one folder. I think so, yeah. Well, I made a tip calculator, and then there's a Deedle tip calculator. I believe both of them are available on Canvas. You can always go to the DEDL website. All you have to do is register, and I don't even think you have to provide a code or anything. You just have to register on their site, and you can download their code examples. So if there, is, if there does happen to be one missing, um, you can go and uh, do that. Yes?
Okay. Do you have that library? Um, I believe so, yeah. And add it to your, your project. And then you can add it to, yeah. Add it, I'm sorry, to be more precise, add it to the workspace. And then add it to the project. Now, you're quite, you're getting back to your question of how many more. Um, that's a good question. You are always welcome to, and again, this might be a little confusing, uh, but one alternative um, would be to have Eclipse also installed on your machine. And I mean, th then you can e e more easily import into Eclipse these examples. And for any new things, do it in Android Studio. So that's a good question. I'm not sure. Probably, um, I don't know, probably soon we'll switch over to Android Studio. Do keep in mind, even if you can't run it, you can still import it and see the code. Well, you can you can always you can always set like take a screenshot and send that to me um, if you want, and I can take a look and maybe maybe find a, a better answer for you. Could be, could be. All right, today we're going to cover the favorite Twitter search app. All right, and let me run it. No. Where, can, what, what is the full statement? Yeah, that 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 make that that yeah, that's exactly right. Well, well, yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, that exact code is in the uh, the previous the example we went over last time, the tip calculator. Nope. It's just a case of being cognizant that any time you have to, you're dealing with user input, that's a minefield. All right. Let me run the favorite Twitter search app. All right, let's let's see how this behaves and then we will see there. Actually, I have some old data. I didn't see the application when I first looked for it. I must have missed it. I've actually modified this slightly from the book and we will um we can look at 
at the differences from it, but the basics of it is the same. Okay, we have All right. We have a query for that we could run to search Twitter. All right. So we could type in a search term that we would want to look at. It could be like a hashtag, it could be anything. We then have a tag that we can have. That's just a way of identifying it. So, for example, let's say I wanted to search for Android Studio. I could type in the full text for Android Studio, and that's the, the search term. That's the term that Twitter will be searched by. I can then give this a tag, and a tag is just like a abbreviation for it. We'll, we'll see in the list how it's going to display the tags. So that's just an abbreviation. So I could make it AS for Android Studio. And then I click Save. And when I do that, it shows me the tag in the list. It shows me edit. And then there's a checkbox. Now, the checkbox isn't in the original. The checkbox is something I added, but we can easily disregard that. Now, if I click edit, I go up here and I can edit it. So I could change that to be Android Studio Beta or whatever and click Save. Hit Edit, it goes up there again. All right? Now, if I click this button, the button that has a tag, it will run out and do a Twitter search for this. Now, I'm not connected to the internet and all that, so this very well could blow up, but... Yeah, I can't connect to the internet. But it would run out, do a search on Twitter, and display the Twitter um, search results for this. Okay. I am able to then go and do a search for something else. iPhone development and I could type in iOS as a tag and save it. All right, from just seeing the outside, just seeing how the app works, let's, let's look at the stuff that is new and different with this. The, the biggest thing that's different about this, and the biggest reason that we're going over this as an example, is that um, the UI is not static. All right, every other UI that we've done before, the UI has been set in stone, right? That tip calculator, there were a certain number of rows in the table, certain number of columns, certain number of views, and it stayed that way forever, all right? Didn't matter what we did, didn't matter what we typed in for the amount, didn't matter what we made the tip percentage, there was still going to be those number of fields. And every other example that we've done so far is like that as well, where the UI is, boom, static. Whereas this, the UI is variable, right? I can go in and, um, what do I want to say? Um, I could go in and uh, add 50 of them, and there'll be 50 of these showing. All right? There's not 50 predefined spots waiting to be filled. The spots are created in the UI. The rows are created in the UI every time I click Save and add a new one. All right? That really is the key part of this. All right? 
There's a couple other little mini parts to this, I guess. One of them is this. I'm actually going to turn this guy all the way off. And hopefully it doesn't take too long to reboot it. So I click restart. So it went all the way off. So that app possibly still be running, right? Because the device is off. I feel like I'm a magician here. Like, I put my lovely assistant in the box and they couldn't possibly have snuck out a back door or something. You know, this couldn't possibly still be running, right? When I open up the app again, however, it's going to still have the Twitter search terms that I put in there before. So this is the first example we have of persistent data. And that is where we save data is around later. And it's not just around like if I open up the app again. It's around if I go in and even if I restart the device so it couldn't possibly be running favorite Twitter searches there we are with the same thing that was on there before so we have persistent data alright there's two things that are in this application I don't think we've talked about before. These might be the only two things. I don't know. I, I mean, only two things from a behavior viewpoint. There's going to be some other things going on behind the scenes that aren't necessarily immediately visible. All right. Third thing that's different about this, I guess the more I think about this, the more different it is, is we are going to launch another activity. Right? And again, I'm not connected to the internet. I don't feel like messing around with that. But it opens up my web browser and tries to do a web search. Another, that is another activity that I'm starting. So far, all of our activities have been like one activity, single activities. All, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. All our apps have been single activities. We start it up, we close it, that's it. So, it's the three things different about this. The first one I want to go over is the dynamic GUI. All right, um, and and we'll go over um, we'll go over the general concepts of what you do when you create a dynamic GUI, and then we'll go over how it works in this specific situation. All right, um, because those are two different things. Every dynamic GUI you're going to have is going to work similar in some respects, but of course each one is its own problem, so it's going to have its own quirks and, 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 and details that, that another one might not have. All right, so let's go and look at this application. Let me open up TextEdit. And let me look at favorite Twitter searches. Under resources. Ah, we have nothing because we can't see it. Here's some of those things I said behind the scenes that are new. We have a couple other values. We have colors and dimensions. Okay. We still have our strings file, which is like it was before, where we just define a bunch of strings. Then we refer to our code. Um, we refer in our code to the um, name of the string in the XML file. And again, in that way we can, we can localize it. We can create a, a Spanish version of this file or a French version or whatever. All right. So this really is nothing new here. Dimensions, though, and colors... are files that we're going to use in our GUI. All right. And again, this is a case, a further case of more components, which is more things to worry about. 
but it's also plays more ways that we can change it in one place and have it taken care of everywhere. Let's say, for example, we like a certain color, light orange. That's the hex code for light orange. All right. Let's say we want to make this a little bit lighter orange, or a little darker orange, or something like that. If this color code was put in several different places, guess what? It would just be like a hard-coded string. And would have to go and hunt down all those places and change it from what it is now to something else. I actually don't like the name of light orange. All right. Why do I not like the name of light orange? It's kind of a weird question, right? It's like, I don't know why you don't like light orange, you know? Pardon me? <laughs> what I don't like about it is this. What if I decide not to make the screen light orange anymore, but make it light blue? Well, what do I do? Do I change this light orange string to be a shade of blue? That's a nightmare of maintainability. Because if you're going in hunting through looking for the color blue, and you see the string is named light orange, you're like, huh? You know, this can't be it, and it'll be very confusing. I would prefer to call it something like background color, all right? Because background color could be any color, right? I could make it light orange if I wanted to. I could change it to light blue. I could change it to whatever. And then if I change from light blue to light orange, I don't have to change the name of anything. I just change the value of, of background from blue to orange, all right? So this is true, by the way, in, in CSS stuff, too. Like if you're doing web development, don't call a style red, all right? Because what if you decide you don't want to use red to designate something, all right? You want to use purple to designate something. Well, then you're going to have to go back, and the things that have a class of red are going to appear purple. Again, nightmare of maintainability. So I don't like the name light orange, but the concept I like, that it has everything in one place. Dimensions are the same way, and they actually did a better job with these because, and let me put both of these in notepads so we can see them better. There's a dimensions resource, and here is the colors resource. Because they're more descriptive. They're saying, I'm making a, this kind of button is that wide. This kind of button is that wide. All right, that way, functionally, I'm saying the purpose of it as opposed to simply repeating the dimensions of it. Now, again, um, color is an important thing to consider because... Different, color, different cultures associate different meanings with colors, right? You know, we have, like, for example, um, people would often wear black to a funeral here in, in Western culture. That's not necessarily the case in all cultures, all right? So if you're developing apps for a worldwide market, all right, and you are aware of that, well, think of all the hooks that you have in your Android app to do that. All right, number one, you have that strings file. So you should never have a hard-coded string. You should always point to that strings file. If you want to have a different language version of it, you just pop in an, uh, a different language version of that. If the colors are significant, like even something minor, like let's say I, had the, uh, I was doing a mobile app for the Olympics, all right? Maybe in the United States, the color scheme would be a red, white, and blue color scheme for the United States. Maybe in Canada, it would be red and white. Maybe in, I think in Mexico's colors are what? Red, red or orange, white, and green. Right. I could, I could change that. The point is, is I could easily customize that and in one file by saying, based on location, I could swap that out. So I could add that. Again, plus there's a whole cultural thing that colors mean and so on and so forth. All right. 
Likewise with dimensions. That's less of a multi multicultural issue and more of a what if I have a bigger device issue. All right. If I have a bigger device or if I have a more dense screen, I might want to have a separate dimensions file to um, actually the, the density is handled by the DP. So I stand corrected on that. If I had a different size of the screen, I might want the button to be bigger, for example. Like, why pay for a nice gigantic tablet when the button's still this big? All right? Doesn't really make sense. All right. So in a nutshell, these work like the values do, the string constant values, but they're for other purposes. Let's look next at the manifest and see if there's anything different. Um, the program should be able to work in either one. The question, the issues that people run into when they go from one to the other is that there's some ancillary files or some work files and, and things related to like how the project gets compiled and all that that isn't per se part of the Android code but is related to it and related, related to compiling. Those are the things people typically have the issues with. But the code, I mean, it's still Java. You're doing your layouts in XML. You're doing, you know, all of that is, you know, if I were to look at the manifest or the layout file or whatever in Android Studio, it would look the same as it does in Eclipse. I mean, it would be the same code. It, it would obviously look the different, difference because of the different user interface and so on. All right, I do not see anything different of substance here. All right, I wasn't sure. I couldn't remember about la launching another activity. I guess since this app doesn't contain another activity, I don't need anything else in the manifest. Let's look at the layout. We have two things. Ooh. We have a main layout. And this is the same kind of layout that we have had from the start. It's a table layout. Like the other one was, table layout. Has table rows. Table row, table row, table row, but that last table row, this is where the fun starts, okay? Because we have a different kind of view that we haven't seen before. Then we have our final table row. Let me go and let me draw the screen and, and identify in the layout what each of the table rows are. So. I'm going to draw the screen. This is my table. My screen, this is my table. The very top of it has a text box for my query. That is row zero. All right. The next line is row one, and it consists of a text box for the tag and a tech and a button. So this is row one. Row two is simply the label favorite Twitter searches. So that's row two. Row three is a big old row. And 
and it contains a scroll view. Now let's think about what that implies. What's a scroll view? Well, a scroll view is a view that you're going to be able to scroll. All right? So a scroll view is a view that we can add other views to. All right? And speaking of other views, what is in that? This is, this is what I was missing mentally because I was briefly confused. What's in that scroll view is a table that starts out empty. So a table with zero rows in it. So let's look at the code for that. And again, this is a case of like nesting one layout inside another. There's my row three. Table row three. It contains a scroll view. What is in, this, in that scroll view? A table layout. How many rows are in that table layout? None to start. So there's no rows in that table layout to start. All right? In a nutshell, what we are going to be doing is we are going to be adding rows dynamically to this table, the table inside the scroll view. Right? Because this is the guy that we want to scroll through. This stuff and this button down here, we want that to be nailed in place. All right? We don't want that, we don't want those guys moving at all. The area that we want to scroll is this area here. So we put a table inside a scroll view. So what that means is as we add more and more and more rows to the table and that table gets bigger than the space allocated for it, we get the scroll bar. All right, and then we can scroll and see the rest of them. Finally, the clear button is row four. So, we are most interested in this example of what's going on in row, row three. All right? If I'm going to draw row three, this is row three of the table. It contains a scroll view, which, when it gets filled up, will give you a scroll bar. It contains a table, which starts out with zero entries, and we're going to, each time we add a query, is adding a row to the table, when it gets to go past the end of that, then we'll be able to scroll it. This table is called Query Table Layout. So that's the thing that we're interested in, and that's the thing that we're going to have our dynamic code add stuff to. The rest of the layout stays the same. I mean, sure, we're going to get values from it, we're going to manipulate it and all that kind of stuff. But those don't move. We don't add anything to those views. We just access and manipulate the attributes and we don't like add anything to it and to make it dynamic. All right. Now, I mentioned that we have a second XML file. New tag view. Without looking at that, what do you think that represents? A 
exactly. This represents the XML code for the new table rows that we are inserting in here. So, our main layout has this. A scroll view that contains a table. Our second layout has a definition of a table row. And that row contains two buttons and a checkbox. So that's the template for each new table row that we take and insert into this table. So we click save once, we make one of these table rows, we put it in that table. We click insert again, we make a second one of these table rows, stick it in this table, and so on and so on and so on. All right? So, we have a layout for the overall structure of the page, the screen, and then we have a second layout for the little dynamic part that's going to get added to each, um, to, to the table for each query that we put in. Let's look at these guys a little closer. First of all, first of all, notice in our main layout, we use the color in a couple of places, I think. Yeah, we say the background for table row 2 is light orange, the background for table row 3 is light orange, and so on down the line. So that again comes from our color resource file. Um, all right. Here is our table row. And that's all it contains, this layout file, is a table row. We don't create a new table every time we add a new query. We create a new row and insert it into the table right here. All right. Now, here's where we use the dimensions, all right, to specify the width of it. All right, remember the dimensions, there are another string file that contains constants relating to the dimensions. Yes? Yes. Actually, I don't know if you made one of your own, what would happen? That's a good question. I don't think you can do that, but, what, you know, try it. See what happens. All right. Nothing in the images but the icons. So, yeah. An at symbol, like in this case, it is saying that the text of this isn't a hard-coded string. It comes from the string resource file, the string that has a name of edit. It signifies what I just said a second ago, that, th that this is not a hard-coded string. All right. This is this is the the resources IDs, right? I'm not I'm not comfortable with that. It is it is where you go to look for something, yeah. The idea though is that like if we were to say this whoops text equals strings edit we would literally get the word strings dash edit or slash edit. 
And we don't want that. We want the value from the strings file of the thing called edit. So that's why we put the at sign. The ID for this isn't ID slash checkbox. That's where you find the ID. So yeah, the at sign means at. That's where you go to get it. Someone hit the button. There you go. All right. Okay. Let's look at our code. And I'm going to focus on... I'm going to focus just on one function for today. Because I think that, well, we'll see. I definitely want to go over this one function. If we do anything else, good for us. All right. Let me go and copy this. I'm actually going to leave this guy open. I'm going to create a new text edit file. Let's go back and look first of all at the on-click listener, because we talked a lot about listeners last time, right? Save button, set on-click listener, is save button listener. So we know we're not doing that first thing that we did, that where we extended activity and implemented um, the on-click listener. So let's look what save button listener is. Save button listener is... Same way we did it last time, an, an inner anonymous class. I say public on click listener, say button listener, equals new on click listener, and oh yeah, here's the code right here. Not in its own class definition file. I'm not giving the class a name, I'm just saying this is the guy. And again, I always talk about reusability and maintainability and reusability. This is sort of the exact opposite of reusability, right? I'm writing code with an anonymous, in an anonymous class, which means I'm not even giving the class a name. So you might say, well, what's up with that? The idea is, is this code is written for a very specific context to link this button to this piece of functionality. So, of course, for every button, we're going to have to write a little chunk of code that does that. This is not the code where we're going to get our big gains by refactoring and trying to write something reusable. So we don't really worry about it. All right. Let's see what, which function I am interested in. It depends how they're written. If it's written like this, where there is no class name, public on click listener, so I'm not creating my own class name, I'm simply extending or rather implementing the on click listener equals new on click listener, and then I have the code for the method for, uh, for the code for all the methods for that listener right here instead of in its own class definition then that's what makes it an anonymous class. All right, let's see what method I am interested in. I am interested in this method. Make tag GUI. All right. Let me explain to you what this does. Remember, what's the tag? The tag is the abbreviation. So if I say, Android Studio, maybe my abbreviation is AS. So for each one of these queries, there's the actual query literal string, and then there is the 
quote tag. It's just a way of identifying it. All right. This method gets called, and I'm not interested today on how it gets called. That's a whole new, that's a whole different thing. All right. It's not critical for us to understand how this gets called to understand how this method works. At some point down the line, this method gets called, and it gets passed in the tag, and it gets passed in the index. All right. The index is the position where we want to put it. All right. If you notice, in, in, when I ran it, it actually alphabetizes them. So if I typed in, it, it's not strictly just in the order I put them in. So if I put in zebras, then antelopes, it would show antelopes before zebras. It doesn't matter what order I put them in, it, it matters alphabetically. So there's code earlier that looks to see where to put this one in in the GUI. So this one belongs in spot 10, this one belongs in spot 5, or whatever. All right. Now, these two statements are big ones. This is a case where we might spend a long time talking about these two statements themselves. It's sort of like this statement. Remember, very early on in the game, I said this was an important statement. And we spent a lot of time making sure we understood exactly what it means. All right? This is like this, these statements here. Specifically, actually, this statement is the one I'm really interested in. This simply creates a layout inflator. All right? Layout inflator, that, that kind of sounds odd, all right? Sounds like we're blowing up a layout, you know? We, we have these layouts and, and we're pumping air into them to inflate them. You almost think of this as being like dehydrated, right? In the XML files, they're not a layout on the screen. They're a description of what the layout's going to look. So, in my XML file, I don't actually have a table row or an edit text or, or any of those things until that gets brought to life. This is like the recipe to create some objects, if you will. It's a layout description. This are, these are the objects that are going to be in my layout on the screen. All right? And what brings this to life? Well, if you remember back, first day of class, the Hello World example, I think only had like one line of code. Set content view, the name of my XML file. All right? Now, what does that do? That takes that XML description of all the objects I want and actually brings it to life. All right? Actually creates the text view and the image view and the spinner controls, and whatever objects are described in the layout come to life when I do set content view. All right? So first line of the code brings this layout to life. And now it lives on the screen, and these objects are real objects that we can point at and do things and so on for. Well. What about this little mini layout down here, this, this second layout that only consists of a table row? All right. Well, until it becomes inflated, hydrated, brought to life, whatever your favorite analogy is, it's just a layout. We're going to use this layout, we're going to inflate this layout, that is, we're going to actually create an actual real table row and put that in that table that we defined in the other layout. So inflating a layout, inflating this XML file, takes this description of objects and actually creates the objects. So. 
When I say this statement here, view, new tag view equals inflator, inflate, R layout, new tag view, null. What that is doing is, is that's creating a new table row somewhere in memory. All right, we're creating this new table row object, and it's floating out there. We haven't added it to the table yet. We just have this table row that's sitting out there in memory waiting for us to do something with it. All right. Well, what are we going to do to it? Well, let's remember what happens when we create a new table row. So if I go in and type in something here, I can't type on these keyboards. So I type in Lorraine Community College in the tag name, or I'm sorry, in the query. I give it a tag of LCCC. Let's talk about this in slow motion what happens. All right, I'm going to describe to you what happens in slow motion, then we're going to look at the code that does that. I click the button. That sets a string of events in place. The on-click listener notes that the button was clicked. It knows it needs to do something. It grabs the values from those text boxes. It looks and figures out what position to put this query, right? Because it's going to alphabetize it. At some point, it is going to call this method. Make tag GUI. It's going to give it the tag, and it's going to give it the position where that tag belongs. All right, so what row of the table are we going to put this in? All right. So what's going to happen is we are going to create a table row that's out there in memory based on the layout that's in the XML file. Well. What's in that XML file? I got me confused why well, I should be pointing at here. What's in that XML file? A button, a button, and a checkbox. All right? So I have a table row sitting out there in memory that's not part of any table yet. It's just sitting there waiting for something to happen to it. All right? That's what inflating does. Inflating says, I'm going to create a new view. It's a view. In our case, it's a table row, but it could be any kind of view, right? We could have any kind of XML in here. This could be an image. This could be an te uh, edit text field or whatever. What we know is that it's some kind of view. Yes. All what views have the same ID? Yes, they do. Good observation. Each one of these have the same ID. Well, obviously not. We just have to see why it's not bad. Right? Okay, and that's coming up in a second. Now, so, out there in memory is our new tag view, which contains a table row that has two buttons and a checkbox. And as was noted, the ID for these is new tag button, new edit button, check delete box. And that'll be the same for the first row that you create to the hundredth row that you create. Well, that seems like it could be problematic. We'll see in a second why it isn't. All right? It isn't problematic because when we grab a pointer here, Notice the subtle difference. Can anyone spot the difference between this line of code and what we've seen before that have looked a lot like it? Hmm. 
No. Okay. Well, this is what this statement says is find a view that has the ID, new tag button, and give me a pointer to it. You know, we've done that since the second or third app, right? We've had like this. Button, save button equals button, find view by ID, save button. So what's the difference between this instruction and this instruction? Wherever it went. Pardon me? Let's Let's put these side by side in another text edit file. Here's the new one that we just shown. Here's the classic one that we've been doing since day two. That's not what I want. Yeah, that is what I want. What's the difference between this button, button, new tag button, save button? Okay, well that's just the name of the variable. All right. Button, button, new tag view, find view by ID versus find view by ID. Hmm. What's the difference between that? This is looking for the thing. In the view named new tag view that has the ID new tag button. This is looking at the thing on the activities main view that has an ID called save ID. All right. So in a nutshell, this is looking anywhere on the screen anywhere on, on the screen because it's looking at the activities new uh, or it's looking at the activities um, um, view, the view associated with that, the content view. All right, remember we set content view. This, however, is finding the thing called new tag button, but it's only looking for it in new tag view. All it's doing is looking for it in new tag view. This is, in a nutshell, why it doesn't matter that these things all have the same ID. All right? If I had a view, oh, what do I want to do? If I said this, let's say I've went and added five or six searches. And I had a statement that looked like that. It would not work. Why would it not work? Because each one of those new buttons that were created for my search has an ID of new, new ID tag view. So if I look on the whole screen, I'm going to find a bunch of them that have that ID. So what do I do? I don't look on the whole screen. I look on just that brand new view that I created that table row that's sitting out there in memory waiting to get added somewhere. In that view, there is only one thing that has the ID new tag button. All right? So the difference between these two instructions, these two instructions is this is looking everywhere on the activity screen. This is only looking within a certain view. Which view? Well, the view that we just created. By inflating that XML. I know this is tricky and it sounds kind of like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth, but let's go over this again. All right. I have XML.
that has. A button with an ID of new tag button. I have a button, let's just worry about the buttons for now, that has an ID called new edit button. All right? And it's contained in a table row. I have my main XML that it contains a table with all these rows. And oh yeah, in table row 3, there is a scroll view. And then there's a table inside that scroll view. Alright. So, when I go in here and I hit this method, what's the first thing I do? Or the second thing I do? I create an object called new tag view. All right. It's of type view. I use this XML to create this object. That's what inflate means. I'm bringing it to life. So, what is contained in this new tag view? Well, a table row. And what does that table row contain? It contains a button that has an ID of new tag view, a uh, new tag button and a button with an ID of new edit button. So this is an object that's living in memory. All right. I have that view called new tag view that has a table row that has the two buttons and there's their IDs. I then say I want to grab a pointer to that new tag button. I don't want to look in this screen. That's what this line does. This line looks everywhere in the activities UI. I don't want to look everywhere in the activities UI. I want to look in that new table row that I just created. I want to look here. How do I know I want to look there? Because I say button, new tag button equals button, new tag view, find view by ID. In other words, what that's saying is in the view object named new tag view, find the view object that has an ID of r.id.new tag button. And let's point a variable of type button called new tag ID or new, uh, new tag button. And let's point it to that button. We do the same thing for the edit button down here. We set the text for the tag button based on the tag, that is the argument. We set the on-click listener, and again, we don't, we're not going to worry about what that on-click listener does, but it does something, all right? It handles the clicking. Set an on-click listener for the other one. And here's the key move. This is what displays it on the screen. I say, add to the thing called table or query table layout, add a view. Which view? New tag view. Well, the one that I inflated from that XML file. And where do I put it? I put it in that index. All right. So, what is query table layout? That's this table here. So, I'm going to populate this ta uh, ta uh, table row object. When I'm all done, I'm going to put it in that table. All right? 
I realize there's a lot of things going on. So we'll go over this again on class, uh, in Class Tuesday. But in a nutshell, we create a new table row using our XML to define the layout of the table row. That's what this guy does. We manipulate that table row by accessing the buttons, setting properties, setting listeners, the whole ball of wax, everything that we've done before. All right. We're able to do that because we're not looking for those views in our main view. We're looking for those views in that new table row that I created. So that's how we can access them, and that's how we can access them even though they have the same ID name. Because, yeah, each of those buttons have the same ID. However, we're only looking at one row at a time, and for one row, there's only one row that has that as an, or there's only one button that has that as an ID for any one given row. The last thing to sort of close the loop here is after we have set and after we've made that table row do everything we need it to do, that is we've set the text of it, we've set the listeners, et cetera, et cetera, we go and actually add that table row that right now is floating in memory, we actually add it to the table. And that's what this does. If we commented this out, all right, We'd go through the whole exercise of making that table row, but then we wouldn't do anything with it. So it wouldn't get added to the main table. All right. Questions about this? We definitely will revisit this on Tuesday, because I know that this is not straightforward. Yet it's something that we're going to come back to, and if you think about it, there are applications that have a very static UI, but many applications have a dynamic UI. You go into your contacts for your phone. How many slots are there for, their, for contacts? Well, as many of them as you have, right? It's not like there's 10 lines for your contacts, and when you fill them up, well, you have to get in an argument with someone and stop being their friend, right? No. You add another one, and then there's 11, and 12, and 13. So. Most applications that do uh, that, that are substantial have some sort of dynamic aspect to their GUI, where the GUI grows and shrinks based on the available data. And this is our first example of seeing that. Questions over this? How does this come into your homework? All right. Um, one of the things you have to do, I think, for Lab Four, is the rock, paper, and scissors game. You have to add a scrolling results to it. So if you won the first game, lost the second game, won the third game, lost the fourth game, whatever, you want to list the results that scroll. Now, this is easier. Your homework is easier than this example by a little bit. Number one, you're not alphabetizing the results. You're just putting them in in the order in which they occur. So you don't need an index to say where to pop that in. You just add it. I forget. I think I said I wanted it in reverse chronological order, so the most recent one on top. So you're always adding to the table at row zero. Add row zero, add row zero, add row zero. All right? The other thing is persistence is, is uh, just an optional thing. You're not required to do persistence. We haven't talked about persistence yet. We will talk about that. Um, in uh, sometime next week. But you're not required to make it remember your results after you turn off the device and turn it back on. Questions over this? Alrighty, that's all I had.